I'm Ben Micellis from the Midas Touch podcast, and welcome to this special midterm elections edition where we will be breaking down the data that you need to know heading into these midterms. We're basically a day away from the midterm elections on November 8th. We're recording this on the weekend. We will release this on audio as well on Monday. And we have with us a guest that we had earlier last week who this will be his 17th election cycle. He was a member in, of the 1992 Clinton war room, someone who has been breaking down the data, not the speculation, not the hype, just what is the data telling us at this point? And by the way, what the data is telling us at this point doesn't mean that's what the data will be telling us on Monday or Tuesday, but we need to look at the data and we can just say what the data says as opposed to what we've been seeing out there, which has been a number of these right-wing Republican polls flooding the zone and groups like 538, including those in the averages. That's why I said, who out there has the data? That's who I need to talk to. And that's Simon Rosenberg. Simon, welcome to the Midas Touch podcast special midterm data I, edition. I know. It's exciting to be here. And it's uh, great to be with you guys. And thanks for having me back. We got a lot of good stuff to talk about today. Well, let's get right into it. Uh, you posted a little bit ago on uh, Twitter. And uh, what you wrote is you said, new batch of early vote data. Just hit the Target Early site. We'll have a write-up for you a little bit later. Stay tuned. So I said, let's get Simon on now before the write-up. Yep. Let's bring it to the Midas Mighty. So tell us about what this new yeah. batch says. Tell us about what the old batch is saying. Yeah, no. And listen, and I'm delaying putting it up to be with you, right? It's, uh, it's why people had to wait. Um, so here's what we know, right? We should just be unbelievably encouraged by what we're seeing. You know, all of us have been told there's a red wave, red wave, red wave, right? And that, you know, Democrats didn't have a chance. And what we know is this. We know that since Dobbs happened, you know, we have seen incredible Democratic energy and performance in five House special elections in um, Kansas, in the voter reg registration numbers changed dramatically. I mean, there was a huge surge in Democratic voter registration. Our candidates raised much more money than Republican candidates did. And so on all these measures of intensity, are like they were all good for us and bad for them, right? And so we just didn't know that was going to carry on to the election itself. You just never know. You got to let it happen. And the issue, and it is carrying on to the election itself. We're seeing incredible Democratic performance and, and intensity in the early vote all across the country. Um, and we should be really excited about that. It means that we've got a real shot. And frankly, you know, the Republicans have yet to show where they have been intense about anything, right? They underperformed in all those elections. They underperformed in Kansas. Their voter reg numbers went down. Their candidates didn't raise a lot of money. And so they're going to have to go from a party that was not showing a lot of energy to one that's going to have to blow it out on election day and do something that's actually getting mathematically more difficult every day that the early vote comes in so big. So let's go, if you want, just let me go through a couple quick data points on this. And so, so today, um, the early vote based on the site called Target Early, which is the most sophisticated early vote uh, analytical site, it's actually the partner of NBC News and NBC News uses their data. So it's not just me and a guy, right? It's actually being, you know, <laughs> coming from the yeah, same data as on the NBC News website. Um, we know today now that in the early vote, 50% uh, of the people who voted are look like Democrats, 39% look like Republicans. Um, so that means we have an 11-point lead. That's a big lead, right? In 2020, uh, at this point, it was about seven and a half points. And in 2018, it was one point a lead for the Democrats. So we, we are now 10 points better than 2018 and three and a half points better than 2020. Pretty amazing, right? Showing no, no red wave there, right? Can't see a red wave there. You see a blue wave, actually. And then in terms of the total vote, we now have 
there are 4.3 million more Democrats that have voted than Republicans. That's a huge number, right? I mean, the margin of Biden's victory in 2020 was seven was seven points, right? I mean, seven million votes. So for, we're getting into the millions and millions of more votes that they have to make up on election day. It's not like it's a million votes. It's going to probably be by election day, given current trend lines, at least five million. It could be five and a half million votes. That's really good, right? The third big point is that um, the vote has shifted. You know, this week has been an unbelievable week. I mean, I was excited a week ago. Everything is much more democratic this week than it was a week ago. This has been an enormous week in the early vote. It's clear that our field organizations, and part of the reason I want to come on today is I just wanted to let everyone know when working in this election, you're doing a phenomenal job. You're kicking ass, right? Things are getting much more democratic as our field organizations and all the people that have been you know, writing postcards and texting and doing all this work, it's showing up in, in the data. Things are getting more democratic. It's three and a half points more democratic this week than it was a week ago. That's a huge change. And let me go, and, and then fourth, the states, what's happening in the states, because it's not universal, right? I mean, some states are better than others. It's our crazy politics. But in general, in the states that really matter, in Arizona, Nevada, um, you know, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Wisconsin, um, North Carolina, for example, just to pick a few states, we're doing much better than we were at this point in 2020. So we've actually increased our vote. And all of this stuff is a refutation. It's a repudiation of the red wave narrative. If the Democrats are the ones who are showing intensity and, and voting in high numbers, where the numbers are really most impressive and where we've seen the biggest gains from 2020 and 2018 have been in uh, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Georgia. Those are pretty important states, right? And so all of this looks really good. And it means that we're going to enter election day with the Republicans being in a very deep hole that they're going to have to dig out of. And, and the question is, is that can they do it? I mean, the blue wave is hit, right? Our wave is hit. We know their wave's going to come, but now it's going to have to be bigger than this big, as John Ralston calls it, the firewall, right? In his when he writes about Nevada, our firewall, I think, is going to be a lot bigger than anybody thought it was going to be on Election Day. So hats off to everybody for their incredible work to have put us in this position where we've clearly got a shot on Tuesday. And Simon, when you say our wave is hit, what I think is also important to note, that's the early vote wave. Right. But with uh, COVID conditions improving yep. and, and look, COVID is, is, is still is still a factor. Um, but with COVID conditions improving, are you also seeing more optimism that there will be a higher day of voter turnout as well by Democrats yeah. and, and potentially independents who will vote pro-democracy? Yeah, I mean, there's clearly both parties are going to have people shifting back to more traditional voting, right? There's no question about that. And, and historically, young people voted later on Election Day. And what you're seeing is that every day this week, our electorate got younger and younger and younger, right? We, we you know, it's still, listen, we're up by four and a half, almost four and a half million votes. And the electorate is older than 2018 and 2020. The uh, we're actually not doing very well this cycle in California. We're off a little bit in California and Florida, meaning that in two of the three biggest states, we're actually down. Um, and so, in an older, whiter electorate, where we're actually underperforming in two of the big states, which are bringing our numbers down, we're still up 11 points. And so, if young people turn out in the next few days, and they've begun to turn out, I mean, part of the reason Nevada. Is looking much better is that young people have started really showing up in the vote there it's very traditional they vote late right that's traditionally the case we're seeing some indication now that you know where we have real data showing that young people are becoming a much bigger part of the the electorate if we have a big youth turnout which is what the most recent poll of young people done by harvard's iop the institute of politics the definitive kind of source on this said that the expectation is in their polling that will match 2018 or above with young people, and they're right now about plus 25 Democrat. If that happens, we're going to have a really good midterm. Um, and you know, I mean, and we've sort of set it up now where if we close strong, all the work that everybody's doing, right? We've just got to keep pounding away because it's working, and we got to keep and we got to close strong. We got to make sure we close strong. We know there's going to be a big Republican vote on Tuesday. 
But the key is, is for us to get to make it impossible for them to match this huge vote we've put up in the last uh, few weeks, and particularly in the last few days. I mean, we've had a really, really super performance in the last just couple of days. You mentioned the Harvard IOP poll. You've yeah. uh, put out on social media the NBC poll, which is yeah. consistent with the data that we yeah. are talking about now. But we've also seen, Simon, an influx, and I see it in my social media feeds. Everybody watching out yeah. there sees it in their social media feeds. And you know, it it feels sometimes like a roller coaster would be putting it yep. lightly where yep. you get to, I read you and then I see NBC and Harvard. And I'm like, OK, these are these are polls that are telling me what the data Simon's saying. But then I start seeing all of these, you know, polls yep. that I know Wick and Rasmussen <laughs> and Trafalgar. And then and those are the ones that are obvious. And then others yeah. I'm like what are these polls that are coming in? Yeah. And then I see people like 538 and, and people who work for those organizations. And I saw you had posted one where you were like, so are you just admitting that it's part of the poll industry? You're just accepting these bad polls because you want other polls to manipulate it. And then that's how you get your weighted average. So like what's going on here yeah, where you I'm talk not... about respectable polls and then there's yeah. all these other polls. Let me try to make this really simple because I, I, this is obviously anybody, I mean, even I'm confused by all this stuff, right? And I think the way to think about this is that if an election is breaking in one direction, right? Let's say if there's a red wave, then everything has to point in that direction, right? The way data works is that, you know, it all, it all has to be saying, yeah, Republicans are gaining ground and they're doing really well and the early vote's really good for them and fundraising is good. I mean, there's all these ways we have of measuring politics. And what's true in the polling is that the polling in the last few weeks has been either neutral for us or actually pretty good, to be honest. If you look objectively at the New York Times House polls, if you look at you know, the high quality polls, if you look at you know the Harvard IOP poll, the Univision Hispanic polls, I mean, there's been a, it, and then today the NBC News poll was really important. This was just done. It was compared to two weeks ago. And what they showed up, and I, let me just go through this for a minute because it's the, the data is really important because it confirms a lot of what we've been arguing, is that because a lot of the polls you've seen, the national polls that have us down three or four points, have Republican intensity much higher than ours, right? That's why they've ended up becoming more Republican. We're not seeing that on the ground. I mean, I mean that may be true by election day. It's not true right now. And so if we are actually the NBC poll, had us even in intensity and gaining, I forget the number, 10 to 15 points in the last two weeks since they polled last. And in that poll, we're ahead because they, the intensity was the same. The Republicans are not more intense than we are. Every measure of intensity is actually favoring us. And I think that part of the red wave you know, narrative and BS around the red wave was that I think it bullied pollsters into sort of favoring higher, better Republican numbers, because the people were kind of looking for it to be better. NBC did what we have been arguing for 10 days, which is you cannot put in your poll that Republicans are more uh, enthusiastic to vote if more Democrats are voting, right? It's a sort of a simple thing, right? And so, the, so I'm very pleased. So you can look at that change, right? I mean, Republicans had a nine-point lead in intensity. And look, you know, Democrats caught up. And if you see that the GOP intensity number went down, by the way, it's a huge warning sign for the Republican Party, right? I mean, this is consistent with the fact that they're not really turning out. There's not the level of intensity they're going to need to win the election. We'll, we'll see on Tuesday. But the other, the other point I just want to make about the polls is that it, so if you objectively look at 538 to all the, the national polls, you know, probably half or 60 percent of them either have us tied or ahead. There were just a couple really, really high profile polls that kind of pushed everybody over. And then the thing you're talking about happened, right? If you take out the nonpartisan polls, things look pretty good for us, right? We had good polls in Ohio and Pennsylvania and, and Georgia and you know, you know, all around the country. Arizona, we had a great poll in Arizona among the high quality polls. Oh, I know what I was gonna tell you. I'm sorry if I'm a little amped up and a little tired, right? Is that so here's the example I did. I put on my 
Twitter feed a couple of days ago. In Georgia, in the last two weeks, let's just look at the last two weeks, there have been five high quality independent media polls that have Warnock up by 3.2 points. It's good, right? That's really good. And then there were five Republican polls and part of this program to flood the poll averages. And they had Walker leading by 4.4 points. That's an eight point difference in the independent polls from the Republican polls. And so what the Republicans are doing is they're basically flooding all seven states and the national averages with these polls that all show them three, four, five points up. They're very consistent in their numbers. Um, and, you know, uh, and so is, I don't know if, the, yeah. So they're all consistent in their numbers. And what they're doing is they're pushing averages instead of, you know, Georgia and these states being two points, three points Dem Democrat, they're now either even or negative. I believe this was a campaign done. The only reason you would mount a campaign that involved, you know, 15 different pollsters and more than 40 polls in seven states, which costs a lot of money. The only reason you would do something like this if you didn't think you were winning, by the way. I mean, I, we need to be really clear about this. This is a sign of weakness, not strength for them. You wouldn't devote this kind of energy and money this late to something that wasn't really vital, because that means that money is not going into GOTV or ads or something else. So they felt this was important enough to have organized a massive effort. Why did they need to convince the country that things were better for them than they were if things were good for them to begin with? And this is, to me, another sign that this is that they kind of bamboozled the media a little bit here. And that the red wave narrative, what I like to say about the red wave is that the red wave may come, but it isn't here yet. And anyone who's bought into the red wave narrative as a journalist has been reckless and irresponsible in my view, over the last few weeks. Because what we do know is that a blue wave is coming. A red wave may come to beat it, match it. It may also fall short. We're going to find out on Election Day. So if you can, take our viewers and listeners through the process that you engage in. So you gave an update earlier, uh, about five hours ago or so, and we posted that one up. And then uh, about 10 minutes before you came on uh, this, you said, I got a new one that, you know, yeah. that I'm, I've looked at the data. And so if you can, what yeah. trends are you looking for? And if you can, you know, what trends have you been looking for all week that you yeah. show is indicating? And what would have been, for example, a cause of alarm for you that you didn't see? And what where's the cause of, of hope that you see? Yeah, I mean, I, the cause for uh, alarm, so it doesn't look like I'm just completely a cheerleader here, is that, you know, um, I would like to be further ahead in Arizona and Nevada. I think we're, um, I mean, we're ahead, but I'd like to be further ahead to feel better. Um, feel very, very good about Georgia and Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin and Ohio. The vote there has been very, very strong. Um, I'm a little worried about Oregon. The data there is not so good for us. California was down a lot in what was scary for the House races there. California has gotten a lot better in recent days, a lot better. Still not where we want it to be. And New York was actually trending very badly. And there are, you know, really critical House races there. And then it's gotten a lot better in the last couple of days. So, you know, a few states have been bouncing around and have been, you know, making us a little nervous, right? But things in, in virtually every state in the country, everything got better in the last couple of days. That's what I mean. I mean, in terms of tracking this. And the state that's moved the most, this is the thing to watch, right? The state that's moved the most is Texas. Better O'Rourke's 100,000 volunteers that he has, the biggest field operation ever built in the history of Texas, is clearly moving the needle there. I mean, he was 10 points down in the early vote a week ago, he's now only two points down in the early vote. That's a dramatic shift. And there's a lot of young people voting there. And I think, and so what I'm looking at most, the most important thing we're looking at is just how are we doing, you know? And it got better almost everywhere um, with one exception. I mean, there's one other state that kind of dropped a little bit, which is New Mexico, which matters because we have two competitive house races there. And I'm actually going to be doing a briefing for some New Mexico politicians tonight uh, my wife's from there. I've, done, I've spent a lot of time out there, and, and I'm a little worried about what we've seen just in the last few days. It feels like Republicans have had a little bit of a surge there. So the data is not universally positive. I mean, I and and I 
But what I try to do is I'm just trying to give you a snapshot, a summary, right? When I do my posts on Twitter. Um, and then for your viewers, here's how it works. In every state, the once somebody votes, the fact that you voted becomes public, not how you voted, but that you voted. And every person has an individual ID, right? So what can happen is that Tom Bonnier at Target uh, early takes all this data and runs it into their national voter file where they have all of us in one you know, big database. And then they can tell that you voted and that you also, they know about your voting history. So they know that you voted in 2020, 2018, and in 2016, you always vote Democrats. So what they do is they look at your voting history and then they say, you know, that's a Democrat. And then they look at a Republican's voting history and they say, that's a Republican. And then there are people they're not sure where the data is not clear, which kind of people who go back and forth, new voters, right? Those go into the unaffiliated category. But you can basically tell about 90% of voters who they are based on their vote history. And um, and so that's, you know, because they know you voted in a Republican primary the last five times. That means you're a Republican, right? And so that's the secret sauce here. And what happens is they get updates from the Secretary of State's twice a day. And that's why you'll see them update twice a day. They take all this stuff in. They run it into their incredible machine, right, that figures all this stuff out. <laughs> And then they pump it out in this amazing website they've built that's free and really easy to use. You know, one of the things that I think also exists, though, on the Democratic side, maybe to the smallest extent possible, that but there really isn't a concept of like a dino, like a Democrat in name only. Yeah. And on the Republican side, you have this concept of are you a MAGA Republican yeah. or are you what the MAGA Republicans label as a rhino? And then you also have the group of whether it's unaffiliated or independent. And yeah. I don't want to draw these broad conclusions if since it's not data-based and scientific, but I can tell you people flood even the comment section right now during our uh, broadcast, but also during some of these other videos. And I've heard tens of thousands, and that's not an exaggeration. It's literally probably 30, 40,000 stories of people who have shared stories. I used to consider myself a Republican or I knew someone who considered themselves Republican, but this MAGA Republican extremist cult thing is dangerous and it's weird. And I, I just, I can't be part of this Trump thing. And Trump is making himself a major part of this, I think, much yeah. to the chagrin of the Republican Party right now, who just like, can you go away? And and, ab and he's absolutely not because because it's his party now. It's not their party anymore. Are you seeing anything? I know it's a yeah. long lead up to the question, yeah, no, but I want to get the question. <laughs> Are you seeing anything there? Um, is the data suggesting anything there? Or yeah. is the kind of like, we'll see, people are saying that, but we'll see. Well, it, it's, it's as you know from my own writing, I have been raising this for months and months and months, that the, the effort to convince, by Republicans to convince Republicans not to vote Republican is unprecedented in the modern era. We've never seen somebody like Liz Cheney, who's such a prominent, comes from such a prominent Republican family, you know, telling Republicans not to vote Republican and putting ads on the air. Bill Kristol, a leader of the conservative movement, somebody who I never thought I'd be on the same political team with, is running $10 million worth of ads in the battleground states of Republicans telling other Republicans not to vote Republicans. And they're, and they're real people, right? It's not, there's not actors and everything else. And they, you know, they, they've gone public with their fear of MAGA. And in every state, in most states, I mean, in Michigan, there were 150 prominent Republicans who endorsed Whitmer. In Nevada, in Arizona, in Texas, uh, in Pennsylvania, there have been these huge groups of prominent Republicans endorsing Democratic candidates. And so it is, it's why, it's, I'm really glad you asked this question, because I've always believed that this was going to have a bigger impact than people understood. You know, if you're what, if you're a traditional Republican, which is about 20 percent, unfortunately, of the Republican Party, it's one out of five, give or take, right, of the current Republican Party. All we need to do is to peel off one tenth of those people, right? You know, two percent, three percent, and it can have a massive impact in a very close election. And so, let me give you some actual data that this may actually be happening, right? I mean, because this data can't—we don't know how these people voted, so there's no way to for us to 
it's an, it's unknowable from this data. But the Marist poll, which is an A-rated poll in 538 used by the New York Times, just did some polling of early voters. So now we have polling of the people who voted in three states and nationally. And uh, so first of all, in that polling, it actually came out more democratic than Tom Bonnier's model, meaning that Tom Bonnier's model and Target Early is actually conservative and maybe more Republican than the actual vote so far, which would be encouraging given that we're leading by 11 points, right? But in Arizona, where is one of those states where there could be significant crossover voting, we have, um, you know, uh, we have Senator Kelly up there by about four points in, from 2020. Um, and, you know, they, they had the vote there being much more democratic than we expected in our, in, based on our numbers, right? And so what it meant was that that was some evidence that a bunch of the people that had voted in Arizona who were registered Republicans had actually voted Democrat. That, that's the first like really concrete bit of evidence that that may be happening. And we just don't know beyond that. I mean, certainly we know from these states that things are really, really close. And um, But I think many of these polls did not anticipate the intensity of the Democratic vote. I mean, we're just seeing crazy numbers all across the country. And it's part of the reason I'm, I'm been out there kind of pretty aggressively, you know, shoving this data in everybody's face because it's sort of absent from the, the current national media conversation. Let me give you one other data point that I just came up with. I'm gonna post for the first time. Just wanna unveil it right here, right? I went back and looked at 2018 and 2020 and, and the final early vote and then how much that was different from the actual vote, right? And so in 2018, um, on election day, it was about, five, we won by about five points in the early vote and we ended up winning by eight and a half. So there was a three and a half point shift from the end of the early vote, you know, which would be, you know, one more day, right? It'd be Monday. Um, and so we're really close to the end, right? Um, so the early vote ended up being, you know, uh, the final vote ended up being three and a half points more in, 2020, it ended up being two and a half points more Republicans. So the change from election early vote to election day was between two and a half and three and a half points. The Republicans have to gain 11 points on election day, right? And in the last two elections, they only shifted by two to three points from the early vote to election day. So the task in front of them is pretty significant right now. And we've, you know, we've put up a lot, you know, we've scored a lot of points early in the game. And now they're going to have to catch up. And, and, you know, the obvious thing we all should be thinking is, which side would you rather be? Right? You'd rather be us. You'd rather be the ones who have already gotten all these votes in than the other side. You know, things can happen on Election Day. Nevada may have really bad weather on Election Day and suppress Republican turnout. They could lose the election over snow in the north and part and it may rain in Las Vegas, which it never does, right? So, you know, we'll see what happens. But I just want to... You know, my basic message to everybody here is, you know, this has been an incredible effort. No, everyone had written this off. The media has been unbelievably negative. Everyone told us we didn't have a shot. And yet, you know, the passion and intensity of the American people, the frustrations that basic rights being taken away, we're just seeing a lot of Americans being, you know, super patriots here and fighting for the future of their country. And look, we may not win on Tuesday. We may come up short. But man, have we fought with everything we got to keep this thing close, you know, to find political gravity, historical odds, and everything else. And I'm just really proud of, to be part of this effort with all of you. Well, and Simon, the good thing, too, is that many people aren't consuming these old media tropes yeah. anymore. Yeah. And people have it's moved away from it and realize that the both sides media isn't there. Heck, we started a whole network where more people watch the Midas Touch Network to get their January 6th committee coverage than any of the major networks. We're, we're averaging more views here. Right now, we've got a massive audience, one of the largest YouTube audiences watching this right now. 
than watching any live stream on any topic on all YouTube on a Sunday, watching us talk about the data and geek out here. But that also means that we've got a huge crowd of people who before Tuesday can go out and do yeah. something as well. And so everyone's seen the link that's been on the screen below where you can join our phone bank with Voters of Tomorrow this Monday between 2 and 4 p.m. Eastern time. We will be providing training for everybody before we start making the calls. And those calls will target young, likely Democratic voters. You can check that out at bit.ly slash call young voters. That's a it's a very cool little HTTP. I'm 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 HTTP colon slash slash Simon. So B I T dot L Y. That's how you know we're targeting young <laughs> voters right there. Go to B. You have to type this in B I T dot L Y slash call young voters. It's on the YouTube right now and do that. And what's your kind of final message, Simon, to everybody who's watching this and you give these, um, you're saying you're going to be speaking to the New Mexico Democrats and, and you give these formal briefings, but our audience now gets to yeah. get a little insight into these formal briefings. So what do you tell our audience who's saying, what can I do? What should I expect? Yeah. I got 24 hours to go. What do we do? Yeah. Well, join this phone bank tomorrow. I mean, the most important thing you can do is call young voters right now. This is absolutely the single most important thing. And I know from doing, I've done 20 hours, I did 20 hours of calls between 2021 and 2020. And young voters are often so grateful that you reached out to them. It's the actual opposite of what you would think, right? Because, you know, all of us who have kids, right? Like the idea, you know, you call your kid, they're all pissed off usually, right? That's not, I, I was been really surprised with how grateful young people are to be hearing from somebody and saying, hey, thank you for reminding me. Do you know where my polling location is? I just moved into this area. Remember with young people, one of the biggest inhibitors for them to vote is that they're transient and they don't really know where to vote and they're kind of intimidated. I haven't really been to that place before. How far away is it? I don't know it. So I found in my calls that when you said, hey, you can vote on election day. It opens at seven. It's, you know, it closes at seven. Here's where it is. You know, it's near this metro, which is the kind of stuff you usually have in your in your in your scripts, right? There, I can't tell you how many times people said thank you for calling. It's really helpful. Appreciate you reaching me out. So these are these are friendly calls. And so everyone should do it. It's really important. And I think just the my final point of this is that look, we've got a shot here. And whatever you're going to do to help, whether it's to be spread this show, other people can watch it, whether it's to make calls, to text, to go, you know, work in an actual field organization and go door to door and canvas to bring people out on election day, whatever you're going to do, do a little bit more of it, right? Book another hour, you know, go for the full call time, not half of it, right? Just do a little bit more. Imagine if 500,000 or a million people do a little bit more in the next couple of days, the difference it could have. And so that's what we need. We need everybody just to do a little bit more. And, and, and finally, just thank you, everybody. I mean, thank you for caring about your country enough that you're even watching this, right? Thank you for having the, you know, for all the work that you've done. We should be so proud of what we've been able to do in a time when the nation needed us to stand up. We are standing up. The Democratic Party is standing up. We're showing up. We are getting it done. And I'm just unbelievably proud of what we've been able to do this year. Simon Rosenberg, thank you so much for joining us. Everybody follow Simon Rosenberg on his Twitter to keep track of the minute by minute. You're posting a lot, man. <laughs> I'm uh, sorry. At, <laughs> <laughs> at Simon WDC on Twitter. I'm glued to Simon's Twitter. I'm glued to Tom Bonnier's Twitter. Yep. And we're going to have Tom on as well tomorrow, Simon. He, he's a guest tomorrow Good. for our evening podcast. So we're going to, we're, we're focused on the data here. We appreciate yep. you. And uh, please give us some more updates from now until uh, election day. I will. Thanks, everybody. And thanks for all that you guys do. It's really amazing. Si to see Simon Rosenberg. Thanks, everybody.
everybody. You know, and now I just want to tell all of the Midas Mighty out there just how important it is to vote, vote, vote. Get out the message. We need people to vote, please. Um, We put in a lot of hard work. Um, Do not in any way give up. And we just presented the data for you folks. That's just what the numbers are saying right now. But whatever you can do, you can actually hold the key to make a big difference here. And so I want to remind everybody, again, we are registering or we are trying to turn out young voters. You can go join our phone bank with voters of tomorrow, this Monday, between 2 and 4 p.m. Eastern time. We will be providing training. The link is below, bit.ly backslash call young voters. Check that out. Also, if you want to support independent media like this, we are not funded by any outside investors at all. We are purely fueled by democracy and we are powered by you and your generosity. So check us out at our Patreon website at patreon.com slash Midas Touch, P A T. R-E-O-N dot com slash Midas Touch. Become a patron by joining one of the memberships there. We've got exclusive content that only our Patreon viewers can see. But don't worry, we still have all this great free content and we're going, we're not going anywhere. We're on YouTube. We just passed 700,000 subscribers here on YouTube. But because we don't have any outside investors and we stay 100% independent, by joining patreon.com slash Midas Touch, you can see that exclusive content. We've got extra bonus podcasts and behind the scenes footage and we have extra q a sessions you can even become an honorary producer of the midas touch podcast and your name will appear at the end of the midas touch podcast and get postcards and posters and there's so much cool stuff but most importantly wherever you are in the world i always get asked well what can you do to help if you can no pressure either way but if you can help out by becoming a patron it goes a long long way so check our check out our patreon site at patreon.com slash Midas Touch. And also for the best unapologetically pro-democracy gear, go to store.midastouch.com. We've got lots of great Midas Touch gear from hats to t-shirts to long sleeve shirts to Rovember, row, row, your vote. Rovember, a rallying call for this Tuesday. That Rovember shirt has been uh, featured all over. I've seen so many people wear it. And look, our stuff is made 100% in America and 100% by unions. And while they say copying is one of the best forms of flattery, not when you don't make the stuff in unions and not when you don't make it here in the United States. And there's so many people who have tried to rip off our Midas Touch designs. And look, if it's spreading democracy, I'm normally like, great, all good, but it's not made here and it's not made by unions. I got to put my foot down there. That's why go to store.midastouch.com and get the unapologetically pro-democracy gear made here and made by union workers. And finally, I say to the Midas Touch community, one of the things I love about this uh, community is that it's just that. This is not some sterile network That's what makes this work is that this is a community. Whenever people say, well, what's the secret sauce of Midas Touch and what the work that you do? And it, I always go back to the answer. It is the Midas Mighty. It is you who are watching this on a Sunday, who are listening to this on a Sunday, who are listening to this the day before the election on a Monday, who are listening to this on Monday. The secret sauce is you because you're out there, you're spreading the unapologetic pro-democracy message, the pro-normal message, and we've all collectively have helped wake up the exhausted majority. Our country is not defined by these extremist MAGA rallies, these 
events that spread fascism and QAnon conspiracy. That is a small fraction of what our country is. And one of the tactics of an authoritarian regime and of authoritarianism is to exhaust you, exhaust you with the hate, exhaust you with the lies, exhaust you with the gaslighting. So you just go, enough, I can't take it anymore. I don't want to do anything. Ah, That is the whole trick of authoritarianism. That is what history teaches us. But we are not going to let that happen here. We see it. We call it out. We condemn it. And we build this community together, this network together in the truest sense of the word that is bigger than the both side ism media. We are bigger than them. We are unapologetically pro democracy, and we are making sure our message is heard, and we will make sure our message is heard on Tuesday. Thank you so much to each and every one of you for watching, for spreading the message. We got this. Special shout out to the Midas Mighty. At Midas Touch, we are unapologetically pro-democracy and we demand justice and accountability. That's why we're spreading our message to Convict 45. That's right, gear up right now with your Convict 45 tees and pins at store.midastouch.com. That's store.midastouch.com.